Welcome to the Tales to Inspire podcast. Before we get started on this episode, I would like to invite you to our community so that you can hear more stories to inspire change within your life and positive change within the systems in which we live. All I want you to do is to click on the subscribe button. Your comments mean the world to us with anything that's resonated with you and I absolutely love your support. I can't wait to go on this journey alongside you. Thank you so much for subscribing. Let's get in to today's episode. I'm Pete Sincock and this is my Tower to Inspire. Just as a quick trigger warning, Pete does talk about his own experiences with mental health and suicide. So if you'd like to introduce yourself, who you are and where you're from and, and we'll go from there. Hi, my name's Pete Sincock. I'm from Torquay in Devon, currently living in Bristol. Um, at the moment I'm not in work, but I kind of have gone through a massive evolution in the last 12 months. I've started to take like real responsibility for myself, my mental well-being, and I feel like I'm at a stage where I'm really starting to discover who I am, and I feel like I'm essentially a butterfly about to come outside of its chrysalis. I love that, Pete. I love it. And then just to let everyone know, so it feels like I've known you for ages, Pete, um, but we've just figured out that I have known you for six months. Um, we met at the Yesterville, which is an amazing festival, which one of our ambassadors, Dave Cornthwaite, runs, which is part of the Yes Tribe. Um, so we met in June of this year, where um, it was a really important part of your life. We'll go definitely go into that. Um, and then everything really since then has been, we've touched base, you caught up with me <laughs> randomly as I was about to do the cycle to inspire on the train when we were down on the way to Cornwall, uh, Mel and I, and you were on, on your way to start your challenge as well, which we'll definitely go into. So, um, yeah, there's loads to go into, and I'm so yeah. excited. But talk to me about the beginning, mate, your childhood. What was it like as a child? Did you have any dreams? What was your family circumstances? Okay, so for my next, my childhood was really difficult. When I was really, really young, I was in an abusive home. My mum's ex-partner was quite physical. We then moved out of that, went forwards. I was then sexually abused when I was about seven. Skipped a few years, got to about 15, 16. Things kind of blew up at home again. Mum's different partner and I didn't get on. I left home at 16 and literally had to begin my life all over again. I was li living in and out of hostels, b and 17, I was then raped by a guy who was meant to be a friend, who obviously clearly wasn't. And it's kind of been a bit of a mess from that point going forward. I dropped out of college twice. And then it was a case of trying to find myself in the world, but I felt like I was paddling 100 miles an hour, but not actually getting anywhere. Um, I then met an amazing p person I was with for like 15 years. And despite the fact that we're not together now, I still have a lot of kind of happy memories and I believe that they helped shape who I am as a person and helped me grow. And then, yeah, going then forward, I've never really kind of felt like I was comfortable anywhere. I've constantly over kind of after the 15 year breakdown, ran from relationship to relationship. I've moved area a couple of times. I've never really felt settled and I never really understood why. And then it was only through people that I've met in my life that I started to kind of realize that I was probably what they class as neurodivergent. And I fully believe now that I'm 100% autistic and I'm more than likely ADHD. This is an awful lot of stuff that correlates of how I am and how I feel regularly and things that go on in my life that literally if you were to look at the definition would cross over and yet I'm a 34 nearly 35 year old male that's never had the opportunity to be tested I've gone through tried to ask for support from the doctors and I've been told that I'm looking at at least 12 months on a waiting list to even be able to see a psychiatrist to get diagnosed for it and that's before I can even get any real support so yeah my uh, my life's been a bit of a uh, upside down and then the last 12 months I've just said I've tried to start to turn it around so let's delve into a little bit of that that starting point if, if that's okay so sounds like a really difficult childhood um did you have any dreams when such turmoil's going on at home did you have any dreams about 
what there was out there or was it more like just survival and not really knowing what was going on? I had the typical boy dream of I'm going to be a footballer. Okay. I realised fairly early that I really wasn't going to be a footballer. But I, I'm really, as you probably well know from conversations we've had, mate, that I'm really into my football. I follow it on a whole different level to what a lot of people do. I kind of, it was something I always wanted to potentially go into, either as a coach or as a scout. I had one opportunity when I was really young to be a, a scout from a fog aisle. But fortunately, my home life meant that I was never in a situation to be able to take that opportunity. And it drifted away and I've never been able to get back in. Um, maybe that's because of obstacles that I've put in myself mentally or because that opportunity is not there anymore. Um, but yeah, it's been interesting. So in terms of that, that starting point, a lot of it comes from relationships with your mother and the relationships she had. Yeah. with the abuse and things that have gone on. Yeah. How do you look back at that time and how do you look back at your mother for, for what's kind of happened? It took me a long time to be able to forgive my mum for what went on. I obviously, when I left home at 16, I might have even been later stages of 15. It was essentially, I felt like she'd chosen her marriage over me and that was really hard to come to terms with and it meant that Although I kind of drifted in and out of her life, I didn't really feel close to her. And for pretty much 10 years, there wasn't really that same dialogue. There wasn't that same openness. And I still struggled to have that really, really close relationship with my family. Like this year, for instance, Christmas and New Year, I spent it on my own because I really didn't want to go home. Um, a lot of that was because mentally I've been in a fragile spot and I knew that going home could present flashpoints. So it was my way of protecting myself was to not engage with that, which for a lot of people would seem mad. You'd think that your family would be what you turn to for support. But for so long, it's been something that wasn't that feeling for me. It never, it didn't feel like a safe space. So I then had to kind of take away from that. I don't know if that answers what you're asking, but. Well, absolutely. And how does it, how did it affect you? So you're going to school, you're a, you're a typical child, you're a, you're a lad, you like football, you like what's going on. Yeah. How did that affect you in the rest of your life? Were you able to share that with anyone else or did you lock it in and keep it to yourself? So going through school, I, to be blunt, was, should have been an exceptional student when I was primary school level I was in the top 3% in the country um, going through kind of teenage years I then had disrupted school life I was in fighting quite a lot there was a lot going on and essentially I ended up leaving school with one A, two B, six C's and a D in GCSE which got me into college and I dropped out of college twice because of my home life just absolutely kind of it got away from me and it's a regret now that I never finished and I feel like I could have done so much more but it's also a life lesson that I've kind of gone through. Um, in terms of like that progression, it's, yeah, it's taken a lot for me to kind of get to a point where I now go, that was me, it doesn't have to be me. It was me but it doesn't have to be me going forward and that, the last year and since yesterday, it's kind of opened that new chapter, and that's kind of what I've taken from my life over the last 12 months. I love it, I love it. Now, going th through that, the difficulties that you've been through, and then going into that relationship. Yeah. So you then said, how old were you when you got into the 15 year relationship? <sighs> 17, 18? So 17, 18, and this relationship is probably the, the savior that you were looking for because things had been so essentially. So you get into this relationship, does life start to go a bit smoother? Um, do you get the regular work job? Do you get, do you, do you have a, a kind of regular life or do you still know things aren't right? It, no, it'd become very much more regular. Um, there was that structure. I felt loved, I felt supported. There was, we got to a point where we'd like bought a flat together 
everything was kind of moving in the right direction. Yes, I'd been, I'd had flashpoints where I'd kind of gone and done stupid things, drank far too much, got involved in stuff that I probably shouldn't have done, lost a couple of jobs because I can't cope with certain relationships with people. Um, so there'd been flashpoints, but that had always been my crutch, my crutch and that support. And going through that kind of, yeah, massive, massively helped me. Obviously, when it ended, it wasn't great, and that really sent me on another spiral. But, yeah, it helped me kind of realise what real life could be like. But it never really took away what I would argue like the autistic and ADHD tendencies. They were still there. It's just... I had somebody I could kind of voice that with and I had that structure and that framework and it's the only way I can explain it. Yeah, it gave that kind of support system yeah. to be able to support that. Yeah. Um, so then you've talked about spiraling yeah. a lot. Like, what does a typical spiral look like for Pete Sincott? Like, what is your spiral when things don't go well? So I've been at points where I've downed a whole bottle of warm off and tried to kill myself. I've been at the top of buildings and gone to jump off. I've... Yeah, I've, I've, when I'm in a really like bad spot, I'm a, I've tried to commit suicide and I've done it on several occasions. And it, uh, I know a lot of people are going, oh, that's just drama. You know, it's just uh, people do that for attention. No, they don't. They kind of, sometimes they might do, and it might be that cry for help, but it's not a thing for attention, that's a cry for help. It's really important that people understand that they are two very different things. A cry for attention and a cry for help are massively different in terms of their meaning. They may appear to look the same, but if you've got a friend or someone that you think's like crying for attention, they probably really need your help but don't know how to ask for it. Whereas I was going for a point where a lot of my stuff was happening behind closed doors and people wouldn't know until after. And it would be like, I've now kind of learned within myself that to recognise the flashpoints and that building intention and that emotion. And I've got a couple of people that I'll call or I'll text and be like, help. Like, really need your help now because my head's going to this point and I don't want it to get to X point. But it's taken me a long time to start to realise that and how to manage it properly. And that makes so much sense that the fact that it takes time to get to that point but one of the things that I've had recently and had a conversation just, just last week was talking about someone who, it was in the news that someone had taken their own life. And I was like, man, I feel so sorry for that person. And the person I was speaking to was like, like what? they were like, it's a bit of a selfish thing to do. And I was like, well, let's, let's dive into this. Like, what do you mean this is selfish? And they were like, well, what about their family members and their friends and the fact that they're not gonna be there for them anymore? And I'm like, well, what about the fact that this person got to a point where there was no hope? Oh, well, they felt that they couldn't go to their family members or their friends. Exactly. Like, where do you sit on this spectrum of, of how, how we should, as a society, look at people who have either tried to take in their own life or are thinking about it? For people to think that it's selfish is, to me, it's maddening because to them, they're doing the most selfless thing they can. Because they've one, okay, they're selfish because they're putting themselves out of their own misery. But I can guarantee you they also feel like they're a burden to their family, they're a burden to their family and friends. They'll probably feel alone, even though they f at the same time feel like they're a burden to their family and friends. They'll feel like they've got nowhere to turn to. They'll feel like it's the last thing. They don't want to do that. Like, I can almost promise you that they don't want to actually do that. They just feel like they've got no more options and they feel like it's the end and that they have nothing more left to offer to anybody. And the, the best thing that they can do is to end it, to stop being that burden. That's it, it's having the empathy to understand where someone else has gone. And, and I get it, it's never good to be in those situations, but one of the superpowers that you've got, Pete, is that you have been through those situations. So anyone else who's going through that, you instantly have a superpower, you can connect to them. When someone says, oh, I understand you, I, I feel you, I get you. Man, I actually understand you because I've actually been there. It's a completely different thing and it builds empathy. 
Like we live in a world where our leaders who lead our society don't understand the people they're leading because they've never lived that. They've never lived what it's like to be a regular person in society. They've been to these colleges or these universities or they've been supported with a massive amount of wealth or they've not had to live on a day-to-day -day basis or go through the difficulties that we've been through. So you've got a superpower, mate. Number one, you have an amazing superpower and it's empathy because you've been through what you've been through. Um, so always remember that, buddy. Um, I want to go into a little bit about the breakup. Okay. 15 years with anyone is, is, is amazing. What, a, what an achievement. But also, when that comes to an end, that must have been really difficult. How do you, where did your life go from then onwards? So, um, it was really difficult. It was, it essentially tore everything that I knew apart. I ended up having to try and restart my life from scratch. So when I walked away, I gave her the property that we lived in. I wanted nothing more to do with it, and when not sure she can have it. I'm, and when I say I walked away, it wasn't my choice, but it was my choice, to be blunt. Um, sounds really weird. I asked her to marry me, she said no. If you've been with somebody for that amount of time, you've brought somewhere together and then they reject a proposal, I felt there was no more, nowhere else to go. I don't know if other people would agree or disagree with me, but I was like, what do I do from here? I then came back to the, because it was in Paris in France, came back to the UK and ended up kissing somebody that I shouldn't have. And it was at that moment, walking back to the flat with an absolute guilt and stress, and I went, if I'm able to do that, I shouldn't be with them. Because if I was truly in love with that person still, how can I possibly kiss somebody else? I walked away and that was the end. There was, it was very, very difficult and it meant that essentially I had to get a place on my own, I had to try and figure out what life on my own meant, who I, again, kind of who I was as a person, but I, I didn't take that time. I rushed from being on my own to within two months I'm on Tinder and I'm trying to get with anything and everything that moves worst thing I could have done. But try and tell that to somebody that's constantly looking for that support and feels that they need somebody else to give them that reassurance and love because they've not done that work themselves, on themselves. Which I know sounds really odd, but if you don't, as somebody that's been through this, and I'm hoping some, some people out there might hear this, if you haven't done that work on yourself and understood your own responsibility for your own emotional support, you can't possibly offer that to someone else. Because all you're looking for is that reassurance and a tick box exercise. If you can't ultimately support you, how can you support someone else? And that's, that is essentially where we're at as a, as a community in society is we have to be able to support ourselves or put in the systems to be able to support ourselves. Yeah. And then from that, we can also support others. Yeah. And I feel like, like you said, we often go to the, the extremes of, I'm gonna try and solve all my issues by going onto Tinder a million times, which is absolutely fine, by the way, or whatever it is. But actually, there's always an underlying thing that we need to have a foundation for our life. Yeah. If we don't have a foundation for our life, whenever the wind blows, we're just gonna collapse. And the wind blows again, it's just gonna collapse until you get a strong foundation. Yeah. And, and that's essentially where you're, what you're talking about there. So how did Tinder go? Where did life go? Like, what, what, what was the journey like? I mean, tell me. Right. Obviously, Tinder was Tinder. Don't need to go any further than that. Um, I then kind of lived in flux for a little bit, and then I randomly met somebody on Christmas Day at a friend's house. And they were then my partner for a couple of years. And we split up last, not November, just gone from November before. And that was part of the spiral that then caused me to be at Yesterwell. Um, because again, I was facing another third relationship where I didn't understand why nobody loved me. Why, why didn't anybody love me? What's wrong with me? Am I not attractive? Am I not a good person to be around? Do I not offer the right kind of love and support? What's wrong with me? Why doesn't anyone like me? And I felt that for so long, not just within a relationship state, but also friendship groups. 
I never really felt like I had a proper friendship group and meaningful relationship slash friendships with people. And there's one person that's been in my life now for a good, oh, got me five years. And I still speak to them on a nearly daily basis. And that's the one person that I could truly go, they're my longest serving current friend. That I could, I know that I could ring them at one o'clock in the morning and go, mate, I am in a fucking horrendous state. And they would be there. That's special. Yeah. And that's so important. So important to have. And it's like, like you said, we, we keep coming back to this one. That one person to support you, that one person who could be there. Like, so, so important. So then, Pete, how did you get from realising it's all going crap to get into the life-changing moment that you had? So, essentially, I'd spoke, I'd, through a friend, met Scott. And Scott's the guy that I live with. Um, we'd been speaking for a while. He would saw the end of my relationship go and, and saw, essentially, where my head was at and how I was really was not in a good space. And from... The moment I met him, he was constantly, are you okay, are you good? Do you want to come over and have a barbecue? Do you want to do this, do you want to do that? And built a friendship with me and was constantly trying to be there. Sometimes I would like push him away and be like, uh, I don't know what to do with this. I didn't know how to react. Um, and then he said, oh, by the way, obviously I'm, we've met for Yes Tribe, he's a Yes Tribe uh, Bristol leader. He was like, oh, you should come to the Yes Tribe. And I gave him every excuse under the sun as to why I couldn't go. I can't afford it, mate. I can't afford it, mate. Mate, I, I'm, I'm, I'm busy. I really, I, um, uh, yeah, uh, my dog ate my homework. Whatever you can think of, I gave him as an excuse and he just went, I've got you a ticket through an amazing gesture system that Yes Tribe run, where they give free tickets away to odd people that you have to apply for and if they feel that the reason's good enough and there's enough money in this pot that people can donate to, then they'll give people tickets. I can't remember the exact name for it, but... It's like a pay it forward kind yes. of thing, isn't it, yeah. And I was lucky recipient of one last year. And then, as I said, a couple of days before yesterday, I was in a really bad headspace and I tried to commit suicide. I'd gone out, I drank far too much, Realised, like, was in really, really bad headspace and essentially got pulled down from a clifftop area in Bristol by some random guy who, as far as I was aware, wasn't even there. It could have been an angel. Just literally come across in a car, jumped over, grabbed me, and buggered off again. I've never seen that person again. I've never been able to say thank you. And from then, I then went to Yesterwall with Scott and Laura. And I was really, really nervous, really, really kind of emotional, found the whole thing overwhelming, but in the most positive way. It is one of the most overwhelming in love and friendship places I've ever been to. The first person I met there greeted me with a hug, which should say everything about that community of people. And it was the first place that I'd felt that I could truly be me and not have to put a mask up or pretend to be Jack the Lad or anything other than 100% me and be comfortable. And I felt over that weekend that there was something just growing in me that was this absolute belief that yes, I could do something better and I did have something to offer. And there was amazing people there. You for one of them, got to be honest. Um, Joe, who, her surname is Joe Bradshaw. 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 Don't, I think she's climbed the seven most highest summits in, yeah. in the world. Yeah. Ridiculous woman, um, like in the nicest possible way, an amazing, ridiculous woman. Um, and then there was oh, Siobhan Daniels, yeah, incredible woman again, one of our ambassadors as well. Yeah, Just, like, yeah. I've heard, listened to the podcast by the way, fantastic. <laughs> if you haven't heard it, go and listen to it, it's great, <laughs> it's great. Book. Um, she's just an amazing woman that went through trials and tribulations and decided to change her life as well, and it was just. It was listening to all of these people that have gone through these journeys and realizing that not everyone's had an easy life. And an awful lot of these people that have done amazing things have actually gone through the shit too. And that it's okay to have gone through it, but it's not okay to be stuck in it. So it was that realization that I needed to kind of 
try and find a way to progress. And then something hit me on second second day. And I pledged there and then that I was going to, for the first time in 17, 18 years, get on a bike. Well, not only was I going to get on a bike, I was going to cycle to Amsterdam and watch Ajax play football. And for those that know me, know that football is my life and that Ajax were the, the epitome of what I believe current world football is. So that was my goal. And um, spoiler, I did it. Man. Within a couple of months, I'd done it. So if we go back to that time, because I was there at that time as well, um, and I remember you announcing to everyone at the Estival that you're going to, and you said, I'm going to cycle next year back to Estival or something along those lines. I'm going to cycle from England to Amsterdam and back. And, you was, and, then, and then you said something mad like, oh, and I don't cycle. I don't, I've not cycled a bike for 17 years. Yeah. And instead of everyone going like, what the hell do you think you're gonna do? How are you gonna, everyone's like, yes, you can do it, B. And, and you didn't just do that in a year. How long did it take you to make that determination to make it happen? I'm probably better off explaining from what happened after I left yesterday. Go for it. So I met an amazing woman there called Julie, who didn't know me until yesterday. And she saw the, emotion that had overcome me and heard a little bit about what had been going on and essentially we'd gone off and we were having a cheeky cigarette and we were having a chat and she went um this is going to sound really weird and I want to make this perfectly clear this is not anything untoward but I believe that I can help you but by doing so I want you to come to my caravan in Scotland spend a few days do some work with me and we'll see what, what happens from there, but I believe that I can help you. And I was like, oh, I'll think about it, thinking, oh my God, that's a bit much. Like, amazing offer, but I don't even know the woman. I've met her like 20 minutes max at this point. And I came, I went back to Bristol, and I was, I'm in an R in, I was like, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. And she'd message me, like, you come in, have you thought about it? Just let me know. And I was like, all right, I'll, I'll think about it. I don't know what to do. I'm really deeply unhappy in my work. I hate, I was in sales for years and I got to the point where I hated it. I woke up every day and I really didn't want to go into work. And then God, the universe blessed me. And to most people, this is going to sound like a curse, but it absolutely blessed me. I lost my job within a couple of days. I went back and was like, not in the right headspace, got pulled in an office, and they were like, right, um, we're gonna either have to dial, downgrade you or let you go. And I went, I'm going. They were like, what? I said, yeah, just fine, I'll, I'll go. Knowing in the back of my head, I'll go to Scotland. I don't know what I'm gonna do after that, but I'll go to Scotland and I'll go and spend that time. The universe wants me to go and do that. So I went and spent a few days with Julie and it started the process. Again, that mode reflecting, looking at myself, working out what was going on. And that then built, and then I was sat there, and this is gonna sound really, really odd, but we'd gone somewhere from Scotland to go and look at a property or something, and gone through the Lake District, and we'd stopped at McDonald's drive-thru. We were talking about different options and different plans, and how we could make my journey happen, and then I was thinking, oh, yeah, down the line. And then I sat there with a 20-piece chicken McNugget meal and a milkshake, and I felt what I can only describe as a heart attack, but obviously it wasn't. It was anxiety. It was a full anxiety attack release. And then out of that came a moment of euphoria. And it's the only way I can describe it is it was that euphoric moment. And I went, it's got me now. She was like, what do you mean? I went, there is no other time. It's now or never. I have no job. I'm in an accommodation which I can go and leave at the end of the month, no issues. I've got a bit of money behind me. There's no reason as to why it can't, I can't do that trip now. She was like, uh, don't think you should go back and do it like immediately, not with it, because I was gonna, I was ready to come back to Bristol and start something <laughs> the following day. She was like, can you at least do a little bit of planning? I'm like, all right, yeah, fine. So we then looked at it and worked out that fairly shortly, the start of the, Head of his season was going to start. Ajax were at home 
second game in the season. And I was like, we can do that one. I was like, the only problem is I don't know where I'm going to live. And she was like, well, why don't you speak to Scott? And I was like, what do you mean? She was just, he's a good guy. He's part of the Yes tribe. He's programmed to say yes, almost. <laughs> just ask him. So I was like, all right, cool. So I rang him up and was like, mate, it's going to sound really odd and I know it's a bit forward, but um, any chance we can move into your back garden? And he was like, Without even hesitation, the guy went, yep, no problem. And I was like, this is what I want to do. He went, yep, 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 no problem. I landed on my feet. Not only is Scott one of the most amazing guys ever, he's also an ex-times trial cyclist. So somebody that hadn't been on a bike in years had suddenly arrived at the doorstep of someone that cycled as a passion. And I went, mate, I need your help. And he went, yep, no, that's fine. And literally started to um, train me for the cycle journey. And used to... We, go cycling quite regularly, almost daily at that point, to get me ready. Middle of the summer, it was great for us by being out. Obviously, the later nights meant that we could go out after work for him, and it hit. And all of a sudden, a couple of weeks later, I've got a plan. I've got everything marked out. I'd use something called warm showers, which, by the way, is fantastic for like helping people find temporary accommodation for the odd night if they're on travels. And the Yes Tribe themselves had been amazing in terms of trying to support me with different places to stay. So I'd, I'd gone from being trapped in a life that I really wasn't happy in to at the start of an adventure within the space of a month. And it was, it was mad. Um, I started in Torquay in Devon and I went from Torquay, Torquay to Exeter this is hilarious. Turned up, I was meant to stay with somebody else in Exeter, for family reasons they had to pull out. So I put out a shout on the Yes Tribe page, is there anybody that can help me? This woman, yeah, 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 I'll help. You can just come and stay at mine. So I thought, fantastic. Turned up at theirs. She hadn't even told her partner that she was in the Yes Tribe. <laughs> he had no idea what the Yes Tribe was. And it was the kids, her little boy's birthday the day after. So, this young lad helped me set up my tent because he was really into outdoor stuff. And it was his birthday the following day and he had some stranger waking up in his house on his birthday. Obviously I was in the garden, but I was still there. And they were just amazing. And that was the start of like, the generosity of people from there going forward. And it genuinely really helped me grow as a person, realizing that I was able to do stuff and have an impact. And one of the big things that I ultimately said that I was going to do during that time period was talk about mental health. Because it's real, it's important, and men need to talk about it. And it's something that I felt that I could do and I had a platform. Now, obviously, as you probably saw, I set up an Instagram page started kind of talking and fundraising and the whole ride itself i raised it for two things do you mind if i drop them in here please do go for it uh one's andy's man club which by the way is a male support group that runs on a monday night at seven o'clock if you were to go on to their website there's probably one in your local area as far as i'm aware they're pretty much uk wide and you can drop in on seven o'clock on the monday and it is men only exclusive tea coffee in a chat and it's a very relaxed atmosphere and then the other one was to donate half the money to and it's kind of the strangers tickets for the yesterday to essentially give back to the same group that supported me and got me to a point where i was in a better place for them to hopefully donate to other people and help somebody else the following year Man. and how did the fundraising go I've raised about a thousand pounds in total, which was incredible. There was um, essentially, I've got a family friend who's kind of become like an adopted mum called Emma, who runs a pub in Torquay, and they raised so much money for me. It was ridiculous. Like they were following me on my Instagram and my WhatsApp. They were raising money for the whole time period for me and made sure that there was a decent excuse me, amount of money to go towards the two quarters come the end of the journey and it was amazing. Amazing. So how long did it take you to get to Amsterdam and back, I guess, is, is, the, is, the, is the event? So I started in Torquay in Devon. Yep. 
Then went to Exeter, Bridgewater, Bristol. That was four days. Bristol to Reading in a day. Then from Reading to London, London to Braintree, Braintree to Harwich. Then I did an overnight ferry from, was it, no, daytime ferry, but ended up obviously ending up in Holland. And then cycling from there to like Rotterdam, Utrecht, Amsterdam on a loop and then coming back across the dunes of Holland, which is incredible. And then up through, again, from Harwich to Braintree, Braintree to Wisbeck, Wisbeach or Wisbeck, I never remember how to pronounce it. Okay, never heard of it. And then arrived at the... Um, um, Big Sky? Big Sky. Okay, okay. And that's, so yeah, so I'd then gone from Harwich to Braintree, Braintree up to Wisbeach, and then Wisbeach across to uh, Big Sky, where... Yeah, it was just, that was my end point. I'd, that was where my whole journey had started and it was the only place that I could really have finished it. Mm. Dave and Ems were amazing. Amazing. And to that, to finish in such a significant time, in such, mate, you're proving that the impossible is possible. You know? This was your impossible. If, you'd, if I had said to you, Pete, three years ago, Pete, you're going to go to this festival and then you're going to do this cycle and you're going to raise money for this and you're going to do it within this time frame, you would have gone... No, it's not me. I don't even own a bike, Chris. <laughs> like, you've done that, and you've done it within, not in a year, you've done it within six months. Actually, you've done it within three or four months. Yeah. And you've gone and done all of this thing. Now, you've done the impossible to make it possible. Think of what else you can do. Think of what else others can do by being inspired by your story. So, overall, what was that time frame? From the first day you went to this, on the cycle to the last day? End of August, roughly. So end of August you finished, yeah. and the start of August you started? Mid-July. Mid-July, so okay, so like six weeks? Yeah. So it was a six-week journey, I mean, I think I saw you I, for the I, first... I don't think it took me six weeks to cycle mm -hmm. it, but from training to finish. Right, okay. So whenever your date was, which you'll probably remember... July 28th? It was, it took me about two weeks to do the whole journey. All right, so two weeks after July 28th. Yeah. So mid-August, you, yeah. you absolutely done everything. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, man, so... Pete, you've gone through all of this, and where do we find you now? Like, where, like, where are you at right now? So I'm currently living with Scott. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, I've kind of been at a point where trying to work out my bigger, my bigger me. So that deep work that I said for people to do, I've been doing it. Um, so I've started to realise that I needed to do more for myself and understand me a bit more, which has led me to ultimately come to the conclusion, as I've spoke, kind of hinted at, that I believe that I'm autistic and have high levels of ADHD. I'm in the middle of trying to get to see a psychiatrist, get that like passed off. I've started to kind of concoct the next plan and what, what's next in my life. Um, it's taken me a while to kind of think about what that might be. But I, since we, you kind of got in touch with me, I've thought about really what, what's my next step. And it's going to sound mad, but in a dream world, my next dream is to become an advocate for men's mental health whether that's part-time, full-time, I want to help other people. And that, that would bring the ultimate joy just to try and help, say, one person. But I think it's really important that these conversations are had. And that's kind of where I am with myself at the moment, is how do I go forward from here? What way can I have the most impact within this spectrum? Well, first of all, Pete, I want to say, before we get into the quick fire round and, 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 and where the fun happens, I just want to say thank you. I'm not saying thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you for thank you for being you, mate. You've overcome so much. Like, and you know what? And you're a hell of a bloke. And you're funny and you're determined and you're knowledgeable, especially when it comes to bloody football. Like too much so you like bamboozle me. But like there's so much to you that's bigger than than the hardest thing you've overcome. But you're incredible, mate. So thank you for just being simple, you know. Pete Sincock, mate, you're a legend. Um, and I hopefully, friends for life, mate, um, truly hope that 
you come and watch a Bottle Wanderers game and I convert you to be a Bottle Wanderers football fan. I'm not sure um, about that. That's my true dream <laughs> if anyone was to bounce the question to me. But um, any, any fans out there, by the way, just letting you know, Bottle Wanderers plug. Um, but, Pete, I've got some quick fire questions I want to fire at you. Yeah. Um, so the way this is going to work is I'm going to ask you a question. Or I'm going to start a sentence. Mm-hmm. You finish a sentence. Okay. So there's no explanation needed for that. Right. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Okay, perfect. I'll try and keep this short. There you go. Life is about? Maximising your opportunities. How much of where you're at right now is because of luck and how much of it is down to hard work? Okay, so, to me, they kind of go hand in hand. In order to get real luck, you have to work hard first, because if you haven't worked hard, you could land on luck but not be able to capitalise on it. Mm, I love that. What should you do more of? Ooh, believe in myself. What should you do less of? Criticise myself. Mental health is? Massively important. I love that. If there was one government rule, the, the, the Pete Sincock rule, and you got to choose anything you wanted, what would that rule be and why? It would be that mental health support is available to all, whenever, wherever they are, at no cost. I love that. When do you feel most connected to you? Ooh. When I'm involved in sport and environment. Like that. If you used to give some advice to your younger self, wherever that you want that to be, mm-hmm. what would that one piece of advice be? Do the work. And that can apply to so much, but do the work. I love that. I absolutely love that. So that kind of goes through. You did really well with that quick fire. You can tell that Pete's listened to a lot of our podcasts, um, but I thought I'd put a few new ones in there as well. Um, so, Pete, the final two questions that I've asked every Tales to Inspire ambassador is the first one, Pete Sincock, what is your definition of the word inspire? Right, so the definition of the word inspire to me is to allow other people to open their minds to the opportunities that surround them. I love that. It's like taking that ceiling off and just seeing the true reality. Yeah. Love it. Um, and my final question that we've asked every Tales to Inspire ambassador is, Pete, if you were to live your most fulfilled life, you got to 105 years old and you're like, yeah, man, I've, I've lived the life I want to live. What's the biggest impact or proudest moments you want to have achieved? So, realistically, I would like to just be remembered fondly as someone that was always there as a friend or a listening ear to somebody else. I believe that's the ultimate thing from my point of view. That's great. I mean, what a perfect title um, and theme for your life. Um, Pete, thank you so much for being on the Tales Inspire podcast. Cheers, mate. Thank you for watching today's episode. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please leave a comment in the comment section below. And we cannot wait to see you for our next episode.